OK. So uh, should I turn this off, put it to sleep again? Uh, so uh, as I said, I give you an example of how you can actually play with this to try to come up with a solution to create your available safe egress time. Okay? Now we need to see what are we comparing that with. Okay? And that is another story. Okay? So the first thing that we need to take into account, so we want to establish the egress time, so that's the required safe egress time. And, uh, and obviously it starts at detection. Okay? So when you look at the problem, your evacuation time is going to be your detection time, your pre-movement time, and your movement time. So what are these terms? Obviously, the detection time is the time that it takes for whatever sensors that you have in there to activate. Okay? Uh, the pre-movement time is the time that it takes you to make a decision that you're going to move. And your movement time is the displacement time. Okay? That is basically the time that it takes you to get from your position to the outside. Okay? Now, the first simplification that we make is a technological simplification. Okay? So what we're going to say is we're going to create a sensor that is sensitive enough, okay? that is going to be activated, and I'm going to place it in as many places as possible so that its activation time is always going to be much, much smaller than this two. Okay? Why is that useful? Because effectively, it's a delay. And I want to make sure that I delay it the minimum possible. Now, can I do that? Can, do I have the technology to be able to do that? Of course we have. So there are several technologies that can do that. The two most commonly used are ionization detectors, which effectively all it is, it is an ionization chamber. In other words, you put a little bit of radioactive material and whenever you get a soot particle entering, effectively it gets ionized and you get a current. Okay? So that is extremely sensitive to the number of particles that you're putting in there. The more particles you put in, the stronger the current, the bigger the sensor. Now, the reality is that you need very little to activate that sensor. Now, the second type of technology is what is called the photoelectric. And the photoelectric is a light extinction beam. So you put a little bit of a, of a light, and the moment the particles get in there, then they deflect the light, and you get a, a, a signal. Okay? So you have a photodiode, and the photodiode captures the light, and you get a signal. Okay? So the two of them are extremely effective. Our problem is actually not their sensitivity, because they are oversensitive. You can get detection literally in a matter of a few seconds. It's the time that it takes for the plume to actually hit the detector, you know, what it takes to activate it. Our problem is actually not that. Our problem is the opposite. They're too sensitive. And what happens when a detector is too sensitive? False alarms. OK? So every time you get out of the shower, your photoelectric detector will go crazy because effectively the steam is sufficient to trigger the detector. Okay? So every time that you burn a toy, your ionization detector will go crazy because you have multiple so little soot particles that effectively activate the detector. I could put an infinite number of those detectors in the ceiling with which I can reduce the time. So my problem is not about sensitivity, it's about desensitizing the detector to the point that I don't get nuisance alarms and people stop paying attention. Is that okay? Now, we have very standardized ways of doing it. So to be honest, there is really no engineering in here. The product manufacturers have devised this to the yin yang. They've tested it. There's a standard way of doing it. We know exactly where to place them. And we can get activation in, in periods of the order between zero and five seconds with no problem whatsoever. Okay? And I'm 100% sure that you've all experienced you know, the wonderful uh, feeling of burning something and then having the detector go like crazy, and then you start blowing air trying to, you know, stop it. We've all gone through that. So I don't need to get into those details. All I need to say is that this value is neglectable compared to this two. Is that okay? And that's a technological solution to the problem. So I eliminated the problem by developing a technology that is sensitive enough. Okay? 
The moment that I eliminate the detection time, my evacuation time is all about the people, okay? It's the pre-movement time times the movement time, okay? All happy with that? So, let's try to understand how people behave. I'm sure many of you have seen this. This is a clip from Seinfeld, and... Uh, that's funny, no? So, I mean, this is one of the key things about human behavior, not that effectively you watch this and you listen to all the jokes and you say, you say, well, you know, this is all very funny and it looks completely ridiculous. I have a better one of, uh, um, what is it called, uh, The Simpsons, you know, that is, you know, it's a drill in the nuclear power plant and it's really funny, okay? And then, you know, you ask yourself, you know, to what extent this resembles reality, no? So I'll show you another one. He's a wheelchair. So this is the club.
So which one is more idiotic? George or the second one? So what was the pre-movement time in the second one? Infinity. Infinity. You know, in this particular case, the firefighters could not get the drunken people out of the club. Eventually, the police had to come and drag them all out. Now, what went wrong? So what, what, what was done wrong in that club? Yeah, the music continued, the lights didn't go on, the lasers were still on. So effectively, the club did not react in a way such that made it evident you know, that the party was stopping. Okay, they just basically let everything roll. They even let the music keep going. And, uh, and, and effectively, that affected in a very negative way the behavior of people. You know, they maintained this feeling that there was no problem in the case. Now, what went right? <laughs> not everybody, not everybody. Huh? Yep. So effectively, the, the fire never grew, no? So you had all this burning material dripping all over the place, and actually none of the materials that were inside the club burnt at all, no? So effectively, you had your curve, and your curve had an alpha of almost zero, so effectively what you had was an extremely long period of time. So while you had an infinite pre-movement time, you had an infinite available safe egress time because the fire was not growing at all. Is that okay? So as you would imagine, I mean, my third video is the worst of them all, no? Because it's a real scenario where people actually behaved absolutely but then the system didn't work correctly. So, this is a famous station nightclub fire, and I'm pretty sure that many of you must have seen this video already, but I'm still going to show it because I think it's a very important uh, event because it actually shows uh, how the system can fail completely. So this event was extremely interesting because uh, this, this was a, a period where uh, there was a feeling that these nightclubs uh, were not being run in a safe way. So a radio station uh, had commissioned a cameraman to come in there and document a, an event in this nightclub. So the cameraman is going in there and is walking around the club showing a number of features of the club that effectively explain uh, more or less uh, how the safety was being handled in that particular case. With three means of egress, which was what was required given the, the population that you had in the club. Uh, unfortunately, of those three means of egress, two of them were actually managed in a very inappropriate way. One of them was behind the stage, so people within the, uh, the club had very little access to that uh, exit. The second one uh, was open, but <coughs> in events where they had a lot of people, they didn't have enough space to store the cakes of beer. So they would use the exit corridor to put all the cakes of beer. So in front of the sign that said exit door, they put a sign that said staff only, which effectively served as a deterrent for people to use that exit. So what ends up happening is that everybody ends up exiting in the direction they came in through the main door. Now, this is a common practice of people. So people have a tendency to always follow the path through which they came in. So we need to be very careful when we design means of egress to make sure that we understand what is the everyday dynamic of movement of people within the building because it is very likely that people will follow the same path that they used to come in. So, he was at numerous stages. Uh, you know, he, the camera show different characters and basically show uh, different features. So here you can see the exit sign. One of the biggest problems in clubs is that there is a confusion of signage because you have so much going on. You have neon lights, you have all sorts of different things that it's very difficult to identify you know, where the signs are. Thank <laughs> you.
So I'm going to let it roll for a little while so you can see some of the features that he shows, but then I'll skip it to the important part. Is the exit sign. That's the main door uh, to which people are coming in. There's the door. But look when he opens the door. You see all the beer that is stored in, in the back. Let me move it a little bit ahead. So the concert is gonna So you see the pyrotechnics are going to start and they're going to ignite the thermal insulation. And you can see very rapidly little flames establishing on the edges around here. You see it's already ignited. Same thing in the other side. You can now see the flames. And look at what the cameraman does. He immediately starts moving out. So pre-movement time is negligible. And you can see how orderly everybody starts evacuating. The alarm goes off. So the cameraman goes around to look at the other doors. So this is less than a minute than the fire started and look at what happened at the door.
no matter what the efforts of the people are, they can actually not pull them out of that clogged door. So within less than two minutes, flames are already coming out of the windows and the doors. You can hear the firefighters arriving. So normally firefighters will arrive between three and five minutes. And nobody came out this exit, and you can see now how far down the smoke is. So what went wrong? Would have made any difference? Yeah. To what extent? No, I do understand that clearly if you have more means of egress, you're going to redistribute the load. The question is, would that would have been sufficient? Why shouldn't it be sufficient? Hmm? Why shouldn't it be sufficient? No, but that's a different story. That's the question that I'm asking. So, so effectively, you have insufficient means of egress. That's perfectly fine. But effectively, you have a fire that reaches conditions that are fully untenable in less than one minute. You know, given my explanation of the two and a half minutes by which the means of egress are designed, would, ha would, would the means of egress, even if they would have been used appropriately, would have been sufficient to get everybody out? No. Yes, so, so, so clearly the, the, the problem here is that the flame spread so quickly. And the issue is, it sh should it have spread that quickly? You know, what was really the problem? What went wrong that made the flame spread so fast? They had multiple, multiple sources of ignition. That's the first point. No? So you have three ignition sources. The, 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 the firewood could manage many folks. Mm-hmm. Uh, just not uh, bashing up a little bit more. Uh, I'm in fire technique and then I go through the egress that I found very funny. Uh, was that even allowed to let you have firewood? Let me put it this way, there is nowhere, you know, in building regulations or in city ordinances that says you shall not use pyrotechnics. Okay, it is not that it's allowed or it's not allowed, it's just simply not contemplated. 
you might say that it's because it's so stupid that we shouldn't be doing it, and that's why. But nevertheless, it's not contemplated. And, uh, and again, we go back to the story of how do you label things. Y you know, if it's not in the rules, shall that mean that you should, you know, would that mean that you should not do it, or that authorizes you to do it? It's just simply no, nobody thought about it, let's put it this way, despite the fact that it happens all the time. Okay, but that's a very big problem. So you have a problem of an ignition source that is evidently quite extreme, that creates multiple ignition points, which none of the systems are ever designed for that. You have a problem of means of egress that are somehow inadequate, but most likely will not change the outcome. Yep, so it was a polyurethane foam, low density open cell polyurethane foam. Yeah. So, so clearly the fact that you had low ceilings uh, accelerated the process. Yeah, yeah. The question is, would that have been sufficient if you actually had a more reasonable material and you would have only a single ignition source? You know, that's really where the question comes up, no? You know, to what extent each of these components are the contributing factors? Okay, so at the end, uh, effectively, the problem is fundamentally the polyurethane foam, and it's the characteristics of the material property, of the material properties that effectively allowed for a massive flame spread rate, complicated by the fact that it's igniting in three places. So what you end up is with a massive alpha. So this value is huge. So you get an incredibly rapid fire growth that eventually involves the whole place. And that is completely inconsistent to all the other measures, you know, in the building. And you can tell because, where did I start with this discussion? I started by saying the detection time should be negligible. But despite the fact that the detectors were appropriate, were placed in the right conditions, and in theory should have activated instantaneously, that even that instantaneously was much slower than the time that it took for people to start moving. So effectively, you overwhelm completely all the different measures that you had in there because we introduced a material that was not consistent with the classification of the building, okay? Now, what, what had happened? So effectively, these clubs are in fairly urban areas. So what happened was that every time that they had an event, the, the music was way too loud. So they built inside the club an acoustic box. So the acoustic box was lined with a very thick polyurethane foam, okay? And that very thick polyurethane foam effectively is what ignites, and it spreads the fire extremely rapidly. And then once it, it spreads the fire extremely rapidly, you, you could have had adequate means of egress, you could have had anything, but it would have still not worked. Now, at some point, that there was a big argument about if sprinklers would have helped, okay? And there's a big debate about that because effectively the sprinklers work to control a fire of a certain size. And this particular fire grew so rapidly that most likely would have probably overwhelmed the sprinklers too. Now, there were a series of tests that were done at NIST in, in Maryland, you know, where they actually show the effectiveness you know, of having sprinklers in this particular case. But the nuance of those tests is that the sprinklers were placed right next to where the fire started. So in principle, it was, it was there to demonstrate the best possible scenario, in which case, obviously, the sprinklers would have controlled the fire. Another argument was about if the foam was, would have been fire retarded. And what we'll see tomorrow when I talk about ignition and flame spread as a function of material properties, you realize that the impact that fire retardants would have had would have been negligible, you know, compared you know, to the other material properties that control the problem. Because effectively what you have is that the fire retardants are going to play on the, pre on, on the activation energy. So effectively what they're gonna do is shift this critical value, okay? But they're going to shift it, you know, from probably 350 to 380. So the capacity that they have to actually alter the outcome is actually minor compared to the capacity that other material properties will have to drive the outcome 
which is the case in here. So as you can see in this particular scenario, what you're facing is a situation where numerous bad decisions were made. And despite the fact that people behaved in an absolutely idealized manner, they rendered themselves in a position where they could actually not leave the building. Now, this is a very, very common situation, and it doesn't only happen in fires, but it happens in many other scenarios, which is the crushing of people. If you have too many people packed, effectively you get to a point where you choke the flow. And again, it's, it, it is Navier Stokes, so effectively you're choking the flow, and what happens is that you cannot get people out. And that's what you saw in the video, you know, everybody trapped at the door and there was no way to get them out because the pressures that you're inducing are so high that you can actually not get people out. So that's a very, very big problem and these are the kinds of things that we're trying to avoid. So when we are designing means of egress, when we are selecting materials, when we're putting detection systems or putting suppression systems, we are aiming at being as far as possible from those conditions. That's what we don't want. That's completely unmanageable. Okay, so we want to find a, a happy place where effectively you're completely far away of those things and things are operating in an almost idealized manner. That's the objective, okay? So, oops. So in this particular case, the growth of the fire, you know, basically has to be limited to enable egress to occur under ideal conditions. That's the objective. You know, if flames spread too fast, then panic you know, it's induced, egress, it becomes unpredictable, and none of your calculations matter anymore. And uh, if flames spread too fast, there is not enough time to evacuate before you reach these untenable conditions, and that's exactly what happened in this case. So, pre-movement time. So this is the way these numbers come up. So I'll show you just some data as examples, but you see, I mean, there's, there's books on this, okay? So people have been conducting experiments, but these experiments are effectively just idealized scenarios. So this is a typical uh, frequency plot for pre-movement times. So basically what that shows you is that if you take a certain population, you will have a mean value, okay? And you will have a basically normal distribution, you know, with a certain standard deviation that effectively gives you the shape of the curve. Okay? So depending on the occupancy that you can have, you can have very well managed scenarios. So for example, these two here, as you can see, uh, they start coming out very rapidly and it's a very consistent form of egress. Almost everybody comes out at the same time. Now, what kind of scenarios will be that? A cinema, for example. What do you do normally in a cinema? The moment that there is an alarm, you sound the alarm, you turn on the lights, you stop the film, which immediately gives a signal to people to start moving out, and then you tell them what to do, okay? So basically, this is an emergency, walk, do not run. So you're giving them very precise, repetitive instructions so that people can actually execute those instructions in a systematic way. So as you can see, you have the capacity to create a very narrow, fast response of people. Now, obviously, if you look, for example, at this one in here, this situation is a situation where effectively people are moving fairly rapidly, but nevertheless, they're moving in a random way. So you have a massive distribution of people, and some people are taking 100 seconds to get out, while some people are coming out as early as two or five seconds. So imagine, what kind of scenario do you think will correspond to that? Why? Why would be an underground train a situation where people are in many ways allowed to do whatever they want? No, no, but that's the movement. We're talking about purely pre-movement time. It's the reaction time. Some people are taking 100 seconds to react. Other people are basically coming out very rapidly. What kind of environment do you think will induce that form of behavior? Sorry? Well, residential areas, yes. Okay, people will do very strange things because depending on, on, like for example, typical cases, people that will take a long time are people that are picking their valuables. Most people have been drinking. 
cases where people have been drinking, for example, that nightclub is a good example of that. Now, obviously, if the nightclub would have operated correctly and they would have turned on the lights and they would have done all the right things, most likely you would have moved into a better situation. Okay? Yep. The lack of familiarity is a very typical scenario where effectively you get this type of situation. So probably museums are not the best example, but it's a good example. Where do you think will be even worse that is actually similar in configuration to a museum, but actually Hospital, in a hospital, what you have is not a problem of pre-movement, because there's very good instructions going on. It's more a problem of movement, that some people can move, some people cannot. Yep. Uh, well, that's an interesting one. So restaurants, again, are problematic, you know, <laughs> because uh, it's an issue of payment. So this type of distribution is typical of a supermarket, okay? Because, first of all, they won't let you get out without paying, you know, which is a problem. So it induces all sorts of b bizarre behavior. Or people that have paid will not get out without their groceries and everything. You know, because they're, so shopping centers, supermarkets have distributions of this nature. You know, because effectively people are left to deal with the situation. Imagine you are in a, in a, in a shopping center, you know, at the Apple store, okay? And you just paid for your computer, and the guy is going in, you know, to pick it up. All of a sudden, it creates a form of behavior that is very unusual, and people respond in very odd manners. Okay? So basically, people have studied these things, and they produce data for different type of situations. I put these three together because I find them odd. Okay, why do I find them odd? The cinema, as I said, is the perfect example. Very narrow distribution within six seconds, you know, you have the peak and, uh, and you have a standard deviation of about two seconds. So a cinema is a very adequate response environment. So this is a cumulative frequency plot. So what you get here is, you know, everybody is out approximately by eight seconds. Okay? Now, if you go here to a school, you will find that on average, a school will take a lot longer despite the fact that the teachers have a tendency to control the scenario. Still, 20 seconds is fairly reasonable. And again, you know, the standard deviation is of the order of about six seconds, so which is not bad at all. Okay? Interestingly enough, look at the church. Why do people don't get out of churches? Hmm? No, because it's not movement. It's pre-movement. Okay, so is the decision to move? I don't know. <laughs> you know, there's some divine concept going on in there that, you know, maybe you see, feel more protected in the church. I have no idea. Yes? I don't know. I, I, you know, this is something that has always puzzled me. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah, so for whatever reason, a church is a place that people don't want to leave. But once they decide to leave, they're all running. Okay, so it's something, it's something strange about what happens in churches. But, uh, but in any case, you can see that very small variants you know, can have quite a significant impact on the pre-movement time. Now, the pre-movement time is just a purely statistical number. Okay? So there is absolutely nothing theoretical behind the pre-movement time. There's a lot of psychological studies okay, on this. Now, one of the things that I need to clarify that is extremely important when you're dealing with egress, we, when I talk about egress, I'm going to have a tendency to be almost derogatory about calculating egress times, okay? because I don't believe that they can be predicted appropriately. Okay? But that doesn't mean that I don't believe that people have to study egress. Okay? People have to study egress, they have to understand human behavior, but they have to do it so we can engineer it out of the picture. That's the objective. Our job is to engineer human behavior out of the picture. 
is the equivalent of the stick shift in a car. You create some ergonomic design that effectively enables every human being to execute the same motions. Okay, very few people are incapable of using the Prindle, you know, the automatic thing. Everybody can use it, no? All it takes is very basic training, and all of a sudden, you can drive a car. Okay? Maybe not always well, but you can drive a car. Okay? So in a way, we need to have a deep understanding of human behavior in such a way that then we can put the right things to engineer the human behavior out of the picture. We want people to behave like Lagrangian particles. Okay? That's our objective. So all these things need to be understood so you can actually create a system that operates as closely as a fluid mechanics model, okay? So in a similar manner, then you can start looking at movement, okay? And this is very important, okay? Because effectively, this is the way most motion in buildings will work. So you're going to have an optimal space that generally is around one meter per second displacement velocities. So people will move at a rate of about one meter per second in an ideal scenario. And there's a range in which that is going to occur. In other words, if you, if you were to take one meter per second, you will get a, a certain density of people per square meter where effectively that will work quite effectively. Now, if you get too close to this side, the velocities are going to come down. So if the densities are very low, then your flow rates or your velocities are going to come down. Why are they going to come down? Because you don't behave like cattle. Okay? If everybody's more or less packed, we all follow each other. Okay? The moment that you have only a few people, people start moving around in a much more random way. So they, on average, move a lot slower. Okay? Now, is that a problem? Not really, because there's so few of them that effectively you can afford having a slower motion. So I'm not too concerned about this because this is the product of the fact that you have almost very few people in the room. Is that okay? What I am very concerned is this. This is choking. So once you get to a certain density, then people cannot move anymore and your velocity plummets to zero. Okay? This is what happened in the Rhode Island nightclub because effectively the density at that door increased so badly that people could not move anymore. Now, this is a very typical form of behavior that can be altered, for example, by the geometry of the building. So, for example, if I look at this, in, I, can, I can show you three different scenarios. So this, for example, this is the density and this is the speed. And this is when you're walking down. So when you're walking down, you have less control over your motion. So if people get too close to each other, then effectively they can induce choking, okay? Now, on the contrary, if you're walking up, you walk in a much more controlled way. So what ends up happening is that instead of choking, you may actually attain some steady state value of velocity independent of the because Gravity is going to try to separate people as opposed to pushing them together. Clearly, you do not want to operate in this space, okay? But nevertheless, upward uh, systems operate better than downward systems. This is where, in many cases, when you have an egress path, you don't put the door at the lower end, but you put the door at the upper end. So you want people to actually walk upwards because you have a more efficient management of the crowd. Now, when it's horizontal, you get somewhere in between, and eventually you're going to get the choking at about two to two and a half uh, people per square meter. Okay, two and a half people per square meter is actually very tight. Now, when do you think interactions between individuals become negative? How far do they have to be from each other? Hmm? A bit more. Exactly, that's it. So effectively, the way in which you can take a sense when people start interacting negatively is exactly the length of your arm. So if you hold somebody's shoulder 
and you keep your arms stretched and you start walking, you will get absolutely no interaction between the people. And you can actually all move at a fairly constant speed. Now, the moment that you put your arms like this, and you get people very close, immediately you have all sorts of interactions between them. And if you have shorter and taller people, that induces all sorts of bad behavior. Now, there's a series of experiments, and you can find some videos in YouTube that are very interesting. Effectively, you hold a broom, okay? And, and it has to be something external. If you do it like this, it doesn't work. But you basically hold the, the broom, and you have another person, and they are at that distance, and then you have them walking with the broom. Then you repeat the experiment and you put them at half the distance and they fall, they trip and fall immediately. Very, very rapidly they're going to trip and fall, okay? So the interactions between people start happening when you are at a distance that is less than your arm's length, okay? And that's more or less intuitively when people are start, still manage to operate correctly. So this is the way this data is obtained. So this is, for example, flow through a door. Now the red hats are just for image processing. So it helps doing automatic uh, analysis of the image and calculating the motion of the people. crowd density in the room. It's not the density at the door when everybody has conglomerated at the door. It's the average crowd density in the room. Now, it's presented like that just simply because it's easier to calculate, okay? But the reality is that that crowd density in the room eventually translates to a certain crowd density at the door. So there's a good relationship between one and the other, okay? But it is presented this way because for design purposes, that's what you need. You have a room of certain square surface area and you have a certain number of people, so that gives you the average density in the room and that's what you use to establish more or less where you're going to be according to those graphs, okay? So, and like that, you'll find uh, data of all sorts of types. So that's the motion data. So for example, here, the time to move is the distance that you have to travel divided by the velocity. Very, very straightforward, okay? So you can see, for example, this is data for tall buildings, and you can see that as people have to travel more and more floors, they start slowing down. So the velocities at 16, 18 floors are going to be about a third of the velocities in the first two or three floors of a building. So you have problems of slowing down, uh, you know, this is data, for example, that was collected for the World Trade Center and a number of other buildings. You know, again, you know, you have probabilistic distributions of the speed of people. You have all sorts of different data that is collected, and all that data is pretty scattered. And all that data is obtained with experiments of this nature. So the reality is that this doesn't represent reality. It represents an idealized reality, and even then there is a massive scatter to the data. Okay, so there's an element of imprecision in all the things that we have to keep in mind. You know, again, more data, you can see again the choking effect. This is flow, specific flow, people per second per minute, per meter of a door. So this will be the size, one meter of doors and how many people are flowing. And you see as you, soon as you get to the two, two and a half uh, people per square meter, you will find again the potential for choking, okay? But again, you can see the scatter of the data. The error bars are very, very large, and those don't really include random human behavior because they're all done in idealized experiments, okay? As you can imagine, we, we don't run experiments, you know, with people in fires, okay? You know, we effectively just have, say, like I did in that class, get out, get out, get out. That's all we do, yeah. Uh, here? Yeah, so effectively what that is, is you have a door, okay, and, uh, and what you have is, uh, this is the width of the door, okay, and uh, data in the y-axis represents the people per meter of door per second, 
okay? So effectively, if you want to calculate the flow rate, so you take this Q, you're taking people per liter per second, and you multiply it um, by W, and that gives you the, sorry, this is the in people per second, okay? So that will be the flow through a door. Is that okay? So in some cases, the data is presented in a slightly different way. So it's not presented as a flow rate per unit length of the door, but in here, for example, it's already presented multiplied by the width of the door. So if you have a door of four meters, that basically means that you can get about three people uh, per second, okay? And, uh, and this data, for example, corresponds to design values. So it's densities that are design values, okay? So people are, you know, the data can be presented in a million different ways, but it's purely just statistical data, okay? So at the end, uh, one of the basic principles, for example, for tall buildings, is the principle of compatibility. And that's a principle that is actually quite interesting. People sometimes think that stairs are there to accumulate people. So what happens if you have a pipe flow and the amount of flow that is coming out is smaller than the flow that it comes in? It blows up, no? Pressure builds up, no? So the same thing in a stair. A stair is intended to flow so to avoid accumulation, the principle of compatibility says that if I am the first person in the top floor of a building and I start coming down, who am I going to see when I get to the floor below? The, the back of the last person. Is that okay? So as I'm walking down, I will always see the back of the last person. Is that okay? So I basically never accumulate people in the stair. So when we design the stairs and we design the doors, we guarantee that the flow rate through the door, the door acts like the valve. So the flow rate through the door is such that the first person coming in is going to see the back of the last person going through in the floor below. Is that okay? That's what is called the principle of compatibility and that's what we use for design of a a stair for a, a tall building or in, in any building. So uh, one of the very important things, and this is the same uh, similar video to the one that I showed before, uh, is a little bit more crowded and it helps seeing a little bit better the concept of queuing. So in this particular case, I'm managing the pre-movement time because I'm explaining them very, very carefully what they're supposed to be doing. So I told them, grab all your things so they're ready. Okay? Then I'm going to ask them to put their hands up when they're ready. rapid is done, so I eliminated the pre-movement time with instructions. Now look at what happens next. So everybody moves, the motion is very rapid, and now everybody's queuing. And of course there's an the idiot. There's always an idiot. <laughs> you can tell, see, it's human behavior. So, but you see, everybody's queuing. So what controls the flow is always the queuing, okay? So we design buildings in such a way that your motion is very rapid and the control of the crowd is at the doors. So you are using your doors to dose people into the corridors at a rate 
that is making the corridors behave in an appropriate way. So my corridor is the valve, okay? So the, 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 the basic design principle is what I'm going to try is my displacement time, which is the maximum egress distance divided by the velocity of egress, has to be much smaller than the time that it gets to take all the people, N, through the door, W times P. Okay, so this is the flow rate per unit meter. W is the width of the door. So this is your flow rate per second. This is the total number of people. And this gives you the longest time. So at the end, you have a displacement time, which is the time that it takes you to get to the door. And then you have the door time or the queuing time, and then your pre-movement time. This time shall be negligible. So I will design all these distances from the furthest corner of the room to the door of the stairs to be short enough that I can guarantee that people will queue at the door. So I can neglect this term and effectively I force people to queue at the door. And this is how I control the crowd. The best place to control the crowd is at the door. So by using and designing the width of the stairs correctly, I'm going to control the people at the door. So, when you have, uh, sorry, yeah. Wouldn't that induce panic a little bit? No, because if you're trying to escape from a room, you always think that once you get to the door, you're going to be out. You know, yeah, but you you just make an assumption. The assumption is that people are going to be exposed to the fire. Yeah. Okay. So this is a key, no? So you compartmentalize the spaces, you do all these things in such a way that you are moving people out much earlier than the fire represents any threat, okay? The moment that you have smoke all over the place, I completely agree with you, but it's already too late, okay? What you're trying to do is manage the places where you can get furthest concentration of people. So you're trying to manage the flow into corridors, you're trying to manage the flow into stairs because that's where you can get the most problems. Normally, getting people out of this room should happen so much faster than the fire reaches any condition of danger that people should not be panicking at that door, okay? So you want to then make sure that they're dosed correctly in your corridors and in your stairs, okay? which is really the two critical points of the whole egress path, okay? So simple hand calculations generally are used for simple geometries, and the precision is truly only a function of the available data. And you can see the type of data that we have is very imprecise, very large error bars, okay? Now, simple geometries include, for example, stairs. So stair shafts are very easy to calculate because it's a one-directional flow. So it literally is Bernoulli. So it's a very simple pipe flow. So the ideal applications are tall buildings, train stations, for example, because everybody, this is a train station, everybody exits, and then they all move in one direction. There are no cross flows. So everybody's moving in one direction. Uh, stadia, same thing, everybody's moving towards the door. You know, and generally when you have limited egress options and no cross flows, hand calculations are perfectly fine. Now, Normally you have these numerical models, and these numerical models are interesting because, again, all they're doing is solving Lagrangian particles, okay? And they're tracking them down. But basically, instead of all flowing in a certain direction, they start introducing some sort of stochastic uh, components into it that, for example, slow down people when they get close to each other. You know, introduce some people that turn around and go in the opposite direction. And numbers of different things that enables you to test certain forms of human behavior for qualitative purposes, not for quantitative purposes. Now, when are these things uh, useful? They're useful generally when you have multiple paths. So when you're ha going to have cross flows, potential bottlenecks, multiple decisions options, then it is much easier to track the flow of people by using the equivalent to a CFD, okay? So normally if you're designing an airport, a shopping center, something that is extremely complex in geometry, this type of codes will be appropriate. Now, let me show you uh, a comparison. So if you look, this is, this is uh, the egress through a stair, and you can see 
these are hand calculations. And they give me numbers between 40 and 82, 35 and 86. You know, here are all the numbers. So these are all the numerical models. And you can see, because they depend in exactly the same data, as you can see, the numbers are almost identical. Okay? So the numerical models give you zero benefit for the very simple calculations. They give you pretty much the same number. They give you some benefit when you have complicated flows because it allows you to test certain qualitative features of the space. So many times, very typical, for example, architects are making decisions. Shall I put three small stairs? Or shall I make the width triple but have one single monumental stair? This type of models, the numerical models, can show you which one creates a more efficient flow. So you can make the qualitative decisions in a better way. But quantitatively, because they depend on the same velocities, they will always give you the same number. Okay? And even then, the number has such a big error bar that you should not be using the number, but just basically using it as an estimate. Okay? So, egress calculations, precision is given by the experimental data, hand calculations for simple geometries, and computations for complex geometries. Okay? So, now, this is where hell breaks loose. Okay? So, this is the address building in Dubai. I showed you a picture of that. So how do you deal with 87 stories burning in four minutes? Pretty tricky, no? Yeah. So clearly, when we have a situation like this, obviously there is nothing we can do. And, uh, and it has disabled completely everything that we could possibly think as a possible egress strategy. So anyway, so we'll stop here, and we'll pick up tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, it's a combination of the insulation and the ACP cladding, just like I explained yesterday.